Hi, I'm Diane Earnshaw, founder of Vox Pops International, and I'd like to introduce you to our podcast series, Expert Voices. During this season, I'll be chatting to research professionals and leaders in their field about how they use and how they integrate insights, video and strategy in order to get great cut through in their companies. In this episode, we're going to be talking to Jeremy Nye, who's a senior insight manager at Just Eat. Okay, so thank you very much, Jeremy, for joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you for not asking me. <laughs> um, so just to begin with, let's just chat about how I'd be really interested to know how you got into Insight in the first place and where did you start and how did it all work? Where did it all go wrong? Um, no, I mean, I love, I love working in Insight. It started off, uh, I had been um, fascinated by media, television, uh, and loved it as a something to watch. And then... But my degree when I was studying was politics. And so I did a master's in political science and it was all about understanding voting behavior. What, what would cause a party to gain or lose support? And after a while, I think I realized that that would be a rather depressing way to spend a career. Um, and so I wanted a more commercial use of those sort of skills uh, of understanding people's behavior. And so I, after working in different places, I ended up doing an MBA in New York and got a job while I was there at CBS and they wanted somebody to help them sell the Super Bowl. So trying to find advertisers who would advertise on the Super Bowl or daytime TV. And that's what got me into Insight. So it was media insight because of that interest in television and that, um, yeah, that route. So at that stage, were you doing a lot of qualitative research? Were you talking to people directly? No, this was quantitative, really. Uh, I it was they would they would be doing surveys sort of tgi type things where you would know in the case of what i just mentioned so um people who watch the super bowl what what sort of what is their um demographic profile that you could pitch to advertise and so on. quite traditional media sales type work and that was all quantitative i don't think we did anything qualitative but there might have been another team i'm not sure how much of that went on so then after that you came back to the uk Yes, I got a job at MTV and uh, as an insight manager, and that was that was less about selling programmes and more about how do we make our channel more popular. Gosh, I remember we actually did some work for MTV years and years ago. It's one of the very first um, projects that we did. Well, we're going back thirty years. Yeah, same. <laughs> yeah, at least thirty years. Okay, so um, what? How is research different in those days to now? Would you say in terms of? And we're probably talking more from the qualitative sort of the interviewing side of, of research? I I don't know that it was that different from a lot of research that's done at the moment. I mean, you would, I'm, I quite like um, focus groups and um, talking to people directly, um, conducting surveys in the traditional way. I, I'm not sure that, <clears throat> uh, I'm sure not sure that we don't need to drop those as methods. And so, but the difficulty, I always worked in international research and so, the difficulty there was trying to make sure you reflected international um, consumers rather than just ones in one country. And that meant a lot of the job was just trying to get anything from them. So working for a TV channel and trying to find out if anybody was actually watching. And if they were, what did they like? You didn't always have um, sophisticated audience measurement data. So so often, often actually you would gain an idea of the popularity of a pro TV programme by whether you got letters and direct response from people, not from a survey that measured how many people were actually watching. Because mm. I first met you when you were at the BBC, and do you remember the? Do you remember we did a load of international research for you then, with videos, and we exactly that we were talking to people about what they were looking for in the news and programs and. Yeah, so I'd I'd worked in Asia as well. I worked at Star Television, and you would have executives sitting in. Uh, Hong Kong, who were trying to develop TV programs for India, say, or the Middle East and beyond. And so our job, a big part of it, was trying to get uh, people to see what the, what consumers uh, or TV viewers, in this case, were like and what did they sound like. And, and at the BBC, we would... So I, I ran research for the World Service and BBC World News and um, the websites for a period. And we would send out... Got all the all the journalism that we know the BBC is very proud of, and it would go out, and we wouldn't get anything back. 
we wouldn't you wouldn't hear what people thought of it or what what people looked like and so we needed the research partly just to help executives understand that there was an audience there and what did they make of what they were reading and and uh, and viewing and listening to I don't remember but those days of video it was, it was kind of like hi8 tapes and editing took ages and well, I didn't get involved with the with the practicalities. Um, we just needed something that we could share with with people. But I could imagine it would. Yes, it's a different world now. So, just tell us about when you started. What sort of why? It, what interested you in using video in research? Well, it was because I think it's the the easiest way to bridge the gap between somebody sitting in one place and somebody sitting somewhere else. You you short of sending an executive to go to another country. I mean, we used to do sessions, I can't remember what we called them at the BBC, but we would have executives going to people's homes. But there's a limit to how many of those you can do. So short of doing that, we would have people, the videos would help bring audiences to life. Um, and sometimes it was about when they were talking about us, and other times it would just be about what they thought about other things. Um, there was a real appetite for this. We, we, we once had an event where we had to use actors pretending to be audience members because and because we couldn't ship audience members back and it actually it caused a bit of a difficulty because the people in the audience didn't know they were actors and until they started putting on accents that weren't appropriate so it was all a bit embarrassing but but video is more effective it's more authentic you're listening to people who you actually care about rather than stand-ins so have you, you used video in pretty much every role you've been involved with in insight i suppose so yes i mean we we it was harder, though, before. I mean, I don't think... We used to film um, focus groups and try to share that with colleagues, and that's never been very a really good experience. Uh, I think... watch. I like focus groups, but watching people sitting in a room talking just doesn't really work. Um, and I think that's an area that we must have been improved as the years have gone by. I can remember being in Mumbai, and we wanted to film things a bit better than that, but they came in with this enormous arc light and camera... A bit like this, actually, but it's not appropriate if you're trying to talk about something, you know, about your your TV consumption in a forum with other people. It didn't work. So, talking if, sort of amongst the research industry in general, do you think there's how do you think video has grown over the last, say, twenty years? Well, I don't. To be honest, I don't know. I mean, I don't. I've worked in certain sectors. And I would say that when I worked in television, we didn't do a lot. We didn't do as much customer closeness work as I'd like. I know that isn't always on video, but I think bringing typical consumers into the into the business wasn't done as much as I expected. I mean, it took leaving television and moving into Just Eat's world to, to really see a big increase in what, what I've been able to commission and share with people. So can you just talk about how you've been using video in the last couple of years? Well, it's it's expanded enormously. Um, so I left, I, I moved to Just Eat from Channel 4. And one of the projects that you'll remember that you were involved with was where we wanted to adapt what we loved about Gogglebox to people eating food. So what I love about Gogglebox is it's it seems, it may not be natural, but it feels like it's a natural view of somebody watching television, responding spontaneously to what they're watching. And we wanted to, um, to do our version of that for food, which is, in fact, one of the reasons why I shifted from TV to food, what I like about it is I love television as a place where the family gets together and sits on sofas and has a good time together. Takeaway food is a bit similar to that. Anyway, from Gogglebox, we commissioned Gobblebox, and that was a, an incredibly good experience. So we, we, filmed, um, we filmed households as they ordered a takeaway meal, and then we filmed the restaurant that they'd ordered it from. And we held um, sort of town hall meetings in the business to sh share edited highlights of what we had learned. That, that's a bit more than two years ago, but it still was a very effective project, I think. Um, so we've done a number of things since then. Do people still refer back to those videos, do you think? I wish there were, I wish there was, <laughs> I wish there were more people around who were there, who were still there from three years ago. But I, I think we... I think within the Insight team, we saw that as a really good way to bring the the outside world in. I think with COVID, you, we no longer 
gather in the office in the same way. So what really worked as a, as a town hall meeting doesn't may not work quite as well with people sitting at home. How do you share research and insights generally around the business? We use Slack to, to, to share a lot. Our customer closeness Slack channel has more than a thousand people in it. It's one of the biggest in, the, in our business. So we share lots of clips there. We have a portal called The Hub where we will write up stories. A lot of the time it's just incorporated into presentations that we give. We haven't done anything um, yet to do with um, video screens in the business. I think we're still getting back into the office. I know it feels a bit like the COVID is long over, but still hybrid working is still work in progress. And so um, we don't do a lot of that, but I think that that would be something to do next. I mean, part of the, part of the thing, the thing about um, that would make coming back to the office a bit more interesting. At the moment, there's too many incentives for people to stay at home. So if you can come up with a reason to come in um, and make perhaps the, the business, the, the building more customer focused, then that would be helpful because I worry that people sitting at home are, 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 are detached from the business and from consumers. And maybe coming to the office would allow, enable us to bridge that gap a little bit. So with your customer closeness program now, what, what have you been able to do, Just not just with video, but generally, how has it been working? Well, it, there's a link with, with video. So for a period, we would take executives out of the office. They used to be, had to be dragged screaming out of the office. No, the opposite. They used to, that's right, they didn't like being out of the office. Now they, it's hard to get them to come back in. But, but we would take them to people's homes and we would, we would, they would watch as, as um, consumers order takeaway meals and then they'd make their excuses and leave. Um, when COVID happened, we had to shift and we couldn't go and visit people. So we had, we organised video calls instead. And I'm sure everybody does this. So it's not, it's not particularly new or um, exciting, but I think it's really fundamental. We did 350 sessions last year from everybody in marketing uh, is required to do a session. We haven't quite got around to everybody yet, but our chief operating officer, chief product officer, they've all done these. And these are recorded and we share clips from them with everybody. So they're not just um, the advantage over getting people to visit homes is that we can share what we experience rather than just a sort of visit to remember it's become something a conversation you can share so we do a lot of that um it's an ongoing we probably did three today and we're, we're gonna keep that going because it's a good way for um colleagues to spend a bit of time with consumers mm. you also do work with the, your suppliers as well like the restaurants as well don't you yes we do sessions with with restaurants um which are very enlightening um and we don't we don't do as many because that's more complicated to to set up but uh, yeah, and, and with couriers as well, the people who deliver the food. So it's, it's, there's such a volume of, of video that we don't expect everybody to watch it all. So it's, it's about getting short clips out of that to share that, that seem to be particularly pertinent. We will use clips that we pick up to illustrate something in a, in a big presentation on a strategic project. <clears throat> so it's, it's valuable as a way of bringing things to life. So would you say as a, as a medium, it lands better with the, the, people you're kind of conducting the research for and the insights for so your stakeholders yes it, it has to be used carefully um you can't expect somebody to watch a 10 minute video very often um i have um i sometimes try to pitch this and watching videos to my colleagues by saying that okay we work a 37 and a half hour week one percent of that is just under 23 minutes so for 2023 spend one percent of your time in unfiltered time with with consumers and video is the best way to do that so when they've watched the videos do they then feed back to you or are the things that make it memorable for gender do, do you are you finding that people will remember like one thing or um i'm not sure we, we ask everybody that's had a conversation to fill out a form telling us what they what they remember so we can find the clip that they think is most useful um that's that's valuable, but um, part of it is just the experience of talking to people. Um, but, but I think um, I mean we're only there's a lot more that we could do with with what we pick up. I think. So generally, what would you say to people? We, we, I don't know if you if you know this, but like if people aren't using video as much, what would you say would be the benefits to them of using video more? 
Well, I, I could talk about a couple of the projects that we've yeah. where we've so that that might help. So we um, uh, actually, there's one other thing I'll talk about before a particular project, which I I, I like. I don't know whether I developed the idea or nicked it from someone. So if you've heard it before, then then I obviously haven't. So on a cold day, um, the dogs that wear winter coats are the small ones, and they do that because small organisms have a higher proportion of their body on the outside so big dogs don't need to have a winter coat small ones do and I think when you are dealing with a small company people who work in there are naturally going to be more open to what's happening in the outside they they might have multiple functions um, our chief executive used to put um, our sort of promoting the takeaway our takeaway company on the windows of restaurants himself so people muck in and, and do that. When you get to a big organization, there's specialist teams whose jobs are to talk to consumers and everybody else just spends all their time on internal meetings and doing whatever they do. Um, the job of, of video and research in general is to bring the outside world in and it's much harder for a big organization because they are, they've got, they're distracted with other things. So I think if you work for a big organization and you're not really trying hard to bring the outside world in then you're you're um you're going to struggle to maintain a customer centricity um and i think the, the little dog example sort of illustrates that it, it's sort of it's called by the way the um the square cube law that as something grows the outside goes up by in squaring and the inside sort of cubes bigger so the bigger the, the so there's a or the surface law so it's um uh, that's that's where that comes from um in terms of a couple of specific projects, so we, uh, I think this might be valuable for people who are who sponsor media. Um, uh, my business, Just Eat, sponsors the UEFA. So we sponsor Champions League, Europa, Europa League, um, women's, and other things that UEFA produce. And you, you helped us with a project, which was to understand the connection between um, football and takeaway food by filming people as they watched the Euros in 2021 uh, and order takeaway meals. And one of the things that we wanted to find out, apart from helping to endorse the decision to sponsor, was to, to see how we should do this. And we found um, that before the match, people were really excited and um, they were thinking about food, they were thinking about the match, and it was all quite a hubbub. During the match, they were thinking about the football. And after the match, they'd really switched off, unless they won, I suppose, if they supported the team that won. And we this it was very helpful for us to see on video the excitement that people had before the game. So it meant that we would front-end all our sponsorship, that we wouldn't be interested in post-match discussions or even during the match. It was it was before the match that, that there was that connection. And it, would, it was visible by watching people's expressions and hearing from them it also demonstrated to us how powerful football was because people would shift their whole homes to accommodate the football in a way that they they wouldn't with other tv programs and that that meant that how they ate takeaway meals shifted as well so I, I think it was very helpful to be able to see directly and you wouldn't have got that if you didn't have the video did you share the video with the sponsors out of interest um we uh, we did some but I think we probably should go back. I mean, this is this is a project that would that would carry on for. It would be valuable not just in the in the initial debrief, but later on as well. It was more more for use internally. And there's one other project that I think I'll talk about, which is more work in progress. So, if you walk down a street and you're thinking, "Where shall I eat?" You might have a selection of restaurants, and you will pick the one that has what they call curb appeal. It just has this ambiance or the you like the look of the staff or the or the people eating there uh, something subtle that you don't really can't quite tell when you go online to order a takeaway meal you can, we don't have any of that you might have images of food but we haven't found a way to capture what might make a, a particular restaurant appeal to you so when consumers are going to order a meal they'll often they're almost buying blind because they don't really know much about places they haven't been to or used before so that often means they'll go for the safe choice or they won't spend as much or they'll they'll go somewhere cheap it's hard to communicate premiumness just in terms of what you can show on a website 
So what your project did was show how skillful use of video in short bursts might help bring curb appeal to the world of online buying. And I think the, the research is very helpful in understanding what an opportunity there is. Now, this is, this is work in progress. But I, do, I think it's, it's valuable because the concept of, um, what's it called, restaurant-generated uh, content, uh, RGC you might call it, would be a massive expansion of video if we were able to find a way to, to do that. But that, that's, that's a project that's still on its way. The use of video in, as a way of helping something that's online to capture the sort of subtlety that you get in real life yeah. uh, is really helpful. Yeah, it's quite hard to share that if you don't... The static fi- picture doesn't necessarily sh- do it, does it? No, and people are suspicious that a food shot is coming from a stock uh, image company. Um, I, I, I I, don't like the idea of homogenising what, what comes across because restaurants, food is very special and individualistic and each individual cafe is passionate about what makes them different and that's hard to communicate except through video, I think. Sort of looking into the future, I'd like to get your opinion as someone who's been in the industry a long time. Where do you think sort of research is going generally in terms of probably again qual, specifically video, but also the role of the insight department in a company? Is that is that becoming more, because I remember it always used to be a bit of a challenge, but is that becoming easier now? Do the, do the powers that be in, in the companies listen to insight more? Does it have a bigger seat at the table? So there are a few questions in there, but but it's kind of the future, really. Where do you think see the future going? I would have thought that the future uh, may still be much like what we have at the moment. Um, it's become cheaper to do a lot of research. Video, I'm sure, is much cheaper than it used to be. Um, but there's still the same issue of trying to bridge the gap between consumers and decision-making executives. I... Um, I don't know if this is a COVID effect, but I suspect the gap between decision makers in businesses and consumers is growing. So the whole purpose of it is to try to enlighten people that might lead quite cloistered lives in a business about what's going on in the real world. Um, I really value, for instance, watching our chief um, commercial officer talking to a woman who um, who had five children and whose partner works as a driver for the National Health Service, has hardly any money. And, and it was valuable for him to hear her talking about food and to share clips from that with the business so that they could see that um, we, we have to maintain a close connection with consumers. And I think video is about, is about that still. Um, I think the world of ethnographic research is probably growing. Um, I'm probably becoming more suspicious as I get older about um, surveys and um the halo effect means a lot of people just the nuance of of people's feelings about one company versus another i think is lost from a lot of the way research is constructed and so um and success probably does come from nuance rather than um brute opinion so i i think i think those sort of roles of research are still going to carry on mm. but I know, I know. In the world of television, um, because you have, which is where I used to work, and which I couldn't, I couldn't work in now. So much of it is now on demand. That to understand consumer behaviour there, you simply look at the the stats on who's watching what, and it's more effective in many ways than asking people. Um, but I think if you know, if you don't work in that field where 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 so much is measured, then I think the role is still really important. Yeah, it's an interesting. The dilemma isn't it because it's just been one of the insight things has always been oh how do I get my message across how do I land it in the boardroom you know and obviously with video it's good and bad sometimes people will watch a video and then they I've had examples thrown at me oh well the chairman saw a video clip of one consumer who said one thing and that's all he now remembers and you know that's what they're going to base the whole strategy on or whatever well I think you, you have to guard against that I mean when we do these closeness conversations we we hope that the 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 totality of what we produce will be is what people will see and not the individual stories although i think also actually the world of big data is very focused on norms it's it looks at average behavior and the value of ethnographic research especially with video is it 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 showcases more quirky or idiosyncratic behavior i think that's really 
really valuable. I mean, even in the gobble box project, we had we had a fa- we had these three women and they ordered this meal and it was all spread out on their carpet. And one of the women said, um, "My four year old loves takeaway. She causes a picnic." And I thought the the connection between her saying that and seeing what we were talking about was very powerful. I'd never heard it called that before. So that was very valuable. One other thing from that project, um, we um, we had them order the takeaway meal. It arrived. The well, the chap went out to collect the food and came back in. And he said, um, the, we said, what was that like? The the experience of receiving the food from the, from the uh, courier. And he said, well, um, the person, when he handed over the food, he, he, he didn't look at him as if he was embarrassed about the food he was handing over. And I think um, it was the way in which he described it and recreated what the, the driver had just done that made it very effective. And so you, you thought, actually, when you hand over the food, that should be a joyous, that's our one bit of interaction with the consumer. How do we make that more effective? So that, that little clip, 20 seconds of somebody saying, oh, well, the guy was avoiding my gaze for some, was is was very powerful and i think that's that's what we would hope to get that's quite interesting and you're right though because it is that one touch point isn't it and if they don't look at you or if they get lost we've had that quite a few not not necessarily with just eat but with others yeah, they we, can't we find so us. much seeing people react and describing things when it's when it's just happened is so much more effective than a survey asking people about something they did last week so uh, i i i think the future is bright for qualitative research video ethnographic research even if other things will, will be harder. So any clips that stand out in your brain, in your mind, as being funny or just like that one person really, I mean, you've already mentioned a couple, but um, is there any? Um, it, well, I, I'm going to not try and do accents or voices, but we have, I mean, some things that come to mind, there was a chap who received a, um, this may not come across as funny, but it, I, at least I remember it. So he received a takeaway order from KFC and it didn't have any chips in. And so just seeing his face uh, was um, just very effective. And in fact, it led to a whole work stream to try and work out whether when people order a meal from a company like KFC, do they assume that chips are coming uh, or not? So there was, there was quite valuable. We've had people speaking... Um, very passionately about things and that, that's very effective. People were talking about their fears. So one woman who ordered a takeaway meal explained that having ordered the meal, she'd now be sitting at the front of the house with her chow chow, worrying about whether the food was coming or not um, because you worry about whether they're going to find the place. And, and, and she, you could see that she was genuinely concerned about this. And again, this is a real live issue in our business. And yet, just the way she expressed it was very powerful. Um, there's lots. I mean, I have I have some favourite um, some favourite consumers that we've talked to. Um, some with uh, one of them who, who would be the better advocate for for our business than Snoop Dogg or uh, Katy Perry because she spoke about um, how when she's on the phone ordering something, um, she can't remember what she's ordered. And mm-hmm. while she was talking about this, her child was making a, a loud noise, and you could see that. It would be difficult, and so the um, the example that she was giving it covered a whole big sweep of work within our business. But she she captured it, you know, why we why she loved ordering food online. So, I, yeah, too many to mention. Yeah. So, thank you very much, Jeremy, for joining us in in this podcast, um, and you know, very very interesting insights and everything. And really happy to talk to you. Really great. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for asking me. <laughs>